Hey guys, today we'll be talking about fluid compartment diagrams. So, before we get started, I want to first quickly go over the total body water. So, total body of water makes up 60% of body weight. And then that 60% of weight can be further divided into two-thirds intracellular fluid and one-thirds extracellular fluid. And keep in mind, water flows from the ECF compartment to the ICF compartment, in that order. Okay, so now that we've gone over that, let's go over the changes we can see when we want to figure out how a fluid compartment diagram will change. The order of these steps are important in establishing how the changes happen, and it's essentially based on the flow of water attracted towards solutes. The first parameter you want to assess are the changes in the volume of the ECF compartment. Is it water loss or water gain? Then you want to look at ECF osmolarity. Is it isoosmotic so there's no change, or is it hyper or hypoosmotic? Once you've established how the ECF compartment has changed entirely, you can then look at the ICF. Because the ICF changes are going to be based on ECF, because the goal is equilibrium in osmosis. So that's the order in how we want to do things, but let's do an example to make sure we understand. Let's take the example of someone bleeding out, a blood hemorrhage. Now this is isosmotic dehydration. This is our normal ECF. Now first we want to look at the volume of ECF. So dehydration, so it's going to be water loss. And it's isosmotic, so no osmolarity changes in the ECF. And then we draw the ECF. And now we can look at how the ICF is going to change. So for water flow from the ICF to move to the ECF, there has to be a change in osmolarity. But in this case, it's an isosmotic dehydration, so there is no change in the osmolarity, so there is therefore no water flow. And that's a key thing to keep in mind in terms of isosmotic situations in general. As a result, there's not going to be any change in the ICF compartment, and then that's your final compartment diagram. So this is an example of how you complete these fluid compartment diagrams when assessing the changes. Now in cases of hyper and hypoosmolarity, things get a little more tricky, but in essence it's the same if you follow the same order of steps. Um, in the near future I'll be posting some more videos with more examples of these, so stay tuned for that!